Hey folks, Dr. Mike Isretel here for Renaissance Periodization, RP Plus, RPU, Hypertrophy Concepts and Tools Lecture Number 10, The Multiple Types of Fatigue. So here we go. What is on the menu for today? First thing we're going to talk about is why uh, fatigue is relevant and really what it is. We're going to talk about the multiple sources and list them of where fatigue comes from. We're going to talk about all these sources separately, local fatigue, axial fatigue, and systemic fatigue. We're going to talk about how fatigue is detected in a later lecture, in lecture 12, we'll actually talk exactly what to do about fatigue. But here generally, we're going to talk about how to interpret it and what implications there are for both training and for direct programming. So let's get into it. Multiple sources of fatigue. There are three sources of fatigue that are relevant to training. Really, there are four. I'll explain that in just a second. Three main sources are number one, local fatigue, which is the peripheral nervous system. That is the nerve that communicates to the muscle and the one that communicates back or ones that communicate back and the muscle itself, right? Uh, sorry, the, the PNS, the peripheral nervous system, just those nerves, right? That communicate to the muscle from the spinal cord to the muscle and back. And then the muscle cell itself, which actually does uh, the force generation and the connective tissue around the muscle cell. So basically the muscle and the nerve that talks to it and gets feedback back is local. And if that stuff gets tired at a mechanistic level, we can call that local fatigue. Axial fatigue, we'll get to defining in just a bit, but it's essentially fatigue of compression of the spinal cord or taxation of the back muscles. Really, really interesting topic. And then the last kind of fatigue or second to last is systemic fatigue. And that's fatigue that affects your entire body. And it's composed of uh, central nervous system fatigue, which is brain and spinal cord of two different types. And we'll get to those later physiological and psychological, which is actually a different kind of fatigue altogether. And then there's some stuff that happens with the secretion of various uh, chemicals generally called cytokines. When you train really hard, they affect the rest of the system. And of course, other organ systems, specifically the cardiovascular system, are affected pretty predictably by training. So if you just train your legs, there's something called systemic spillover fatigue that affects all the other systems and other muscles. So very different type of fatigue than just local it's going to need a different treatment. It's going to need a different diagnosis, so on and so forth. Lastly, and this is kind of a little point at the end of the slide here, when you're talking about fatigue and managing it and reducing it in the context of training, we have to realize that not all fatigue comes from training. So there is all kinds of other training stressors and non-training stressors that you do, walking around a lot, running to catch the bus, having a really stressful day at work, moving around a ton, physical stuff. You can do another sport, tons of physical fatigue, which is not covered by these uh, training-induced fatigue, hypertrophy training-induced fatigue sources. In addition to that, there's psychological fatigue that is also has nothing to do with training. If you spend you know, a ton of time uh, fighting with an ex-girlfriend on the phone, that is a ton of psychological fatigue that actually affects your systemic fatigue and thus your ability to train super hard. So yes, these are the three sources of training-induced fatigue, but we have to not forget that all the other fatigue that comes from training has to be dealt with somehow. We'll talk about later exactly how to deal. Let's get into the details. Local fatigue has three separate components. First component is the PNS, the peripheral nervous system. Essentially, the main focus of this kind of fatigue is the nerve that communicates from your spinal cord to the actual muscle itself that says fire, fire, fire. Because there's another nerve that goes through your spinal cord, it tells that nerve to talk to your actual muscle. Especially close to the muscle itself, that nerve essentially comes up and there's a junction between the nerve and the muscle called the neuromuscular junction. Here's the muscle, here's the nerve. And the nerve communicates through various neurotransmitters by secreting essentially very, uh, various chemicals into this junction. And those chemicals hit right on the muscle surface and there's further communication to tell the muscle to contract and so on and so forth, right? But just that nervous system part, especially this last part, super close to the end of the nerve, it gets tired in a variety of ways. For example, you can, uh, you know, in order for this nerve to keep firing, 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 if you say contract, 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 every time you fire a nerve, you essentially have some chemicals flow into the nerve and flow out of the nerve. And that's what causes the cascade of electrical activity that actually is the information of the nerve. The inflow and outflow, once the chemicals that go in 
go in, they have to be pumped out really quickly so they can come back in. And the ones that are pumped out have to go back in and have to be pumped out again. So there has to be a resetting every single time because you get essentially chemical inflow and then chemical outflow. But the outflow is different chemicals and that happens at the same time. Sodium, potassium go one way and the other way. They have to reestablish their gradients, which means basically as nerves fire, you have, for example, sodium goes into the nerve like crazy. And then for it to fire again, all that sodium has to be pushed back out. The processes that repump and reset a nerve to be able to fire again work incredibly efficiently, but not perfectly. So after an intense bout of firing, the efficiency of reflow is not 100%. And some of the messages from the spinal cord, for example, could not get through because the nerve isn't actually reset when it's supposed to be. In addition to that, there are neurotransmitters that are essentially chemicals that communicate from this part of the nerve secreted into the neuromuscular junction between the muscle and the nerve. And then they go touch the muscle and makes it do, you know, essentially makes the muscle contract, right? But there are only so many neurotransmitters stored in little vesicles and little containers inside this distal area of the nerve. If you use a whole lot of them rapidly, intensely, tons of nervous communication, fire, 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 you can actually run low on neurotransmitters, specifically in the muscle to the nerve, it's acetylcholine, and potentially run low on some of the resupplies that make those neurotransmitters, potentially run low on transport proteins, so on and so forth. And what ends up happening is the nerve firing from here, from the spinal cord all the way down to the neuromuscular junction could be A-OK, but there could be a neurotransmitter problem and not all of the signal gets through. You get signal degradation. There's almost never a time when the nerve just doesn't do anything, but like you're trying to say go 100% and it might only communicate 90%. This is a problem because it means the muscle is listening to the nerve and says, oh, 90%, sweet, got it. And it just only goes 90%. Well, that's fatigue. And at some point, you know, the muscle goes 99%, you can still perform at a high level. It goes to 90%. You have a detriment. It goes to 85, 60 or whatever percent. And all of a sudden you might not even be contracting half the muscle that you're supposed to be. Thus the hypertrophic stimulus is severely, severely de degraded, right? Not just the nerve that re that gets into these problems. When the muscle cell, and we'll get into this in just a second, generates a ton of metabolites, lactic acid, for example, the metabolites can actually flow into this neuromuscular junction and they radically change the acidity and thus the behavior of chemicals in that neuromuscular junction and can lead to what's called excitation contraction decoupling. Excitation is when the nerve says, hey, muscle contract and contraction is the one the muscle contracts. Usually that's coupled essentially one-to-one. -one. The nerve says go, the muscle doesn't. But if you have a bunch of gunk, for lack of a better term, a bunch of metabolites and acids and all this other stuff in the neuromuscular junction, and actually some of it flows into the nerve itself and there's tons of it in the muscle, at all of these points, you can essentially get uh, an interference effect, which again, not all the signals get through because there's so much acid. Sometimes it's like, oh, fire. Okay, great. But sometimes it's like fire. I don't know what's going on. And the muscle never really senses anything. And then the firing doesn't happen. So that excitation contraction uncoupling, it's actually something you can feel if you train to failure or beyond failure every now and again, especially with like relatively high reps. When you have a lot of acid, if you ever felt a huge burn in the muscles doing high rep lunges, you psychologically still feel very strong. Your nervous system still feels strong. You feel like you can push. You contract your quad and you literally feel like a, an emptiness, like nothing's happening. Like you're trying to make it go and it's just going, and it's just not doing much. You know, that is actually excitation contraption un uncoupling in part, right? So all of these things are to say that when the muscle isn't cooperating, we can't just say it's the muscle for sure. It's actual nerve, it's motor nerve that makes it contract may be a part of that uh, lack of cooperation. So that's the peripheral nervous system side of local fatigue because it's local, it's to that muscle itself. It's the nerve right there at the quad that's giving us trouble. Second is the muscle cell. This is the most obvious source of fatigue and kind of where most of the fatigue really is centered and sort of where it starts. It's like the focal point. The muscle cell itself fatigues for a variety of reasons. One easy one is fuel depletion. You have this much glycogen starting out after a bunch of contractions, you have this much glycogen left and you need a lot of it to fuel really powerful contraction. And when you run low, then contraction is no longer very powerful and you have fatigue as observed in decreases in performance and perceptive decreases of, oh, I got fuel really, really weak, right? So fuel depletion, super easy. Some fuels replete really quickly. So uh creatine, uh, phosphate, the phosphagens, ATP, creatine phosphate, et cetera, they take seconds or a minute and a half or something to replete. 
Other sources like uh, glycogen, for example, well, they take hours in, of eating to replete and perhaps even longer. So it depends on the substrate. But, you know, this lecture is not designed to determine uh, acute fatigue and cumulative fatigue. It's, uh, you know, acute fatigue causes cumulative fatigue by just summing up. So that's actually the super simple explanation there. Um, but this is so an acute and cumulative, this stuff happens. And how long the fatigue takes to dissipate is something we'll chat about later altogether. Another source of fatigue in the cell itself is metabolite presence that needs clearance. So a cell can, a muscle cell can contract, 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 and it produces a lot of lactic acid. And some of that lactic acid can't be used anywhere and it piles up in the cell. Cool thing is that probably contributes to muscle growth, that literally a lot of that lactic acid tells the muscle like, hey, time to grow. But if you have a ton of it in there, it literally interferes with every part of excitation contraction and the actual muscle contraction. So there's a certain level of acidity in which the contractile proteins themselves that make the muscle cells contract can no longer work. They just don't, nothing happens, right? And if you lactic acid is that high, first of all, you feel a really nasty burn because the nerves around the area pick it up. But second of all, your ability to contract unless your fatigue is going to be, or contraction ability decreases, fatigue concomitantly is very high. Lastly, damage right? You absolutely damage the cell in a real physical sense with high power contractions. Parts of molecules crack off and fly off. You have rips in other molecules, like the connective molecules that actually make sure to hold everything in place. And that kind of damage absolutely sums up, especially over multiple reps and multiple sets, right? So like within one set, metabolites are real nasty, but between sets, they usually come down to reasonable levels, usually. Damage is something that set after set after set, you experience more and more damage, and your ability to do any of these things well starts to really go out the window, right? So damage in the, in the sense of literally like, you know, how fatigued is your car? Well, how beat up is your car? Same idea. And if parts of it are missing, if the steering wheel doesn't turn one way, it's not going to be able to work optimally. So if someone could test your car for fatigue and say, well, how fast can you race around the track? If you can't turn your steering wheel properly, you're going to have a slower time around the track. Same exact idea. Parts of your cell are literally broken. And that's absolutely a thing. Lastly, and this one's kind of super obvious, is local connective tissue fatigue. So your muscle cell can be sort of super good to go and produce a ton of force, but the connective tissue sheath around the muscle is starting to have micro tears in it, and that's called a fascia. The aponeurosis can have tears in it, micro tears, which is essentially like a tendinous-like connection to another muscle or to a bone or something like that from the muscle itself. Tendons, of course, ligaments, and various parts of joints can accumulate literal damage as you train. Usually they don't accumulate a whole lot of damage in any one session, but they certainly do. But over multiple sessions, multiple sessions, multiple sessions, joint multiple sessions, multiple sessions, multiple sessions can actually start to come up until it's relevant. And sometimes the way it's relevant is increases injury risk. And that's why volumes and loads have to be managed. You can't train super hard forever, right? That's all local, which is to say, <laughs> If you train the living crap out of your biceps, your quads are going to have no more tendon damage. They're not going to have any more muscle cell damage or peripheral nervous system fatigue than they did if you didn't train them at all, right? And if you train the biceps at all or not, no, no relation whatsoever, right? Next. So that's local fatigue. Before we get to systemic, we have to talk about a special case of sort of local fatigue. This is why we put axial fatigue in between systemic and local, because it's kind of between the two. So axial fatigue really does deserve, in the context of hypertrophy training, its own mention. It's nothing that we would mention if we were doing a fatigue chapter on uh, soccer players or something, a fatigue discussion on soccer players. Uh, we might mention local fatigue and systemic fatigue. We might not mention axial fatigue. Axial fatigue, we're not exactly sure why it results. It's probably due to vertical loading of the spine and the specific detectors of that, and or the muscles of the spine having to be uh, highly, highly active and the fatigue of those muscles, the damage of those muscles. It's very likely based neurologically because the way it seems to operate is uh, very neurologically. What that means is even if your back muscles are tired, why would that make your leg muscles weaker? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense at the local level. Like if your back muscles are really tired and you were squatting, you would start to round over and then you could still do the same with your legs, but your back position would suck. Axial fatigue is when you have enough spinal loading, your brain, your central nervous system seems to communicate to all of your other limbs, hey, ease up. 
because we're beat up and transitioning force, transmitting force through the axis of the body might not be a real good idea. So then if you're really axially fatigued from lots of loading of the spine, what might end up happening is if you load a spine during the movement, your legs become weaker during that movement. You used to be able to squat more. You literally feel like your legs can't lift as much. Okay. Really, really trippy effect. And we'll talk about how to test for that later. It usually occurs. I mean, it's cumulative, like all other sources of fatigue. And it usually, the biggest contributors are movements that heavily load the spine and the, uh, the or spinal erection musculature. Erection. I hope you guys caught that. So deadlifts, huge, huge axial fatigue. Squats, especially the heavier, the more fatiguing. Rows and to some extent, leg presses, right? But much less of an extent, the squats. And that's something we're going to talk about in a little bit. The heaviest spinal loads, those are the ones that cause axial fatigue the most. No surprise, right? So if you're doing curls, holding 90 pounds, 90 pounds of tension passing through your spine, eh, you'd have to do a lot of curls to get a lot of axial fatigue. If you're doing standing barbell shoulder presses, ooh, that's more weight now. And a lot of contraction of the spinal musculature to keep you in the right position, more axial fatigue. Especially when you have to generate really high forces to stay stable at the top. Squatting, tons of axial fatigue. Squatting low bar, even more axial fatigue because the weights are heavier and there's more back involved. So think of it like that. And the reason we're mentioning axial fatigue is this. You may not be systemically fatigued. Like the rest of your body is generally fine, but pushing your training might get your axial fatigue up to a limiting amount before systemic fatigue gets to that amount. So systemically, you might still be fine, but after a few weeks of training, a lot of squats and deadlifts, for example, your leg training might suffer significantly because your axial fatigue is so high. So it pays to look at it as a separate source of fatigue so that we can address it as a separate source of fatigue. And we'll talk about in just a little bit how we can potentially address it, what exactly we can do about it to make sure it doesn't get out of hand in such a way that interferes with our training too soon in the training process. Of course, it's eventually going to get out of hand, you know, six weeks after we started an accumulation mesocycle, then we need to deload, duh. But it would really suck if you had a nice six-week accumulation meso planned and you knew damn well systemic fatigue wasn't going to hit you or local wasn't going to hit you until the six-week mark. And at the three-week mark, your axial fatigue is too high, right? So it's definitely something that requires its own mention. Lastly, for this section, systemic fatigue, tons of contributors. First, physiological central nervous system fatigue, right? When your brain and spinal cord are deciding to contract muscles or messaging to contract muscles, this particular ner neurons, right, that are part of the nervous structures that tell whatever muscle to contract are the ones that are very, very active. They run into the identical problems that the peripheral nerve runs into when it has PNS fatigue at the local level. Failure to reestablish gradients, reductions in neurotransmitter load, and thus, again, failure to have a uh, total signal transduction, right? So, for example, the primary motor cortex, which is the part of the brain that essentially tells you sort of how to do a squat, how to execute that movement. If you're doing squats, you do tons and tons and tons of squats. The specific uh, nerves involved in those communications can become, to some extent, tired, right? And fatigued and need maybe a few hours, maybe longer, maybe some minutes, um, to reestablish their ability to fire at 100% efficiency. So it's absolutely possible that central nervous system fatigue in these ways, even if the local muscle is totally good to go and totally fine, even if the local nerve is totally good to go and totally fine, the central nervous system can be fatigued and then you don't exactly get what you want. You can't train in such a way that pushes the local muscle to within its limits, which at newsflash, as you've heard from other lectures, is the way hypertrophy happens. So that's one of the reasons why systemic fatigue, specifically central nervous system fatigue, is so nasty because it feels like you're training hard. Your performance is down, of course, but because it feels like you're training hard, you could say, you know, well, I'm training hard, mission accomplished. But the problem is it's only hard for your nervous system. It's not hard for your local muscles. And your nervous system having a hard time at something makes their nervous system better, which is nice, makes you better at squatting when you're tired. But it, it's such a easy challenge for the local system because it's barely being called on to do anything that nothing sort of challenges it and it doesn't get better. For example, if you wanted 
to improve the efficiency of a local fast food joint. You want the employees to get a challenge, lots of volume of work, tons of angry customers. And so they can really improve the watch them, how they respond. And you have someone there who coaches fast food restaurant workers to become more efficient in their movements. You have someone there like when they have the challenge, he's like, okay, here's what we learned. Here's how you change yourself. And then they become slowly better over time because they're really, really good at responding to super high volume, high demand times. If the workers are pushed to their limits locally at that store, they learn, they grow, they get better, just like muscles. But if you try to do this and the uh, branch office uh, basically doesn't, uh, send you, you know, it, it stops advertising for your, for your local store and you have way fewer employ people coming to buy your stuff and buy your food, then yeah, it maybe is very hard for the branch office, right? It's tired. Let's say it's, it was tired. It was too lazy to tell people to advertise your, your McDonald's, but then the employees of your McDonald's are like, eh, seems like a pretty easy day. And are they getting better at their jobs? No, because they're not being pushed to the limit. Same idea with muscles. It's not the pushing the whole system to the limit that gets you better at hypertrophy. It's the pushing the local muscle to the limit. The only way you can do that is to make sure the central nervous system and other systemic factors are not the limiting factor. It has to be the local place itself, the local muscle itself that's the limiting factor. That way it gets pushed, challenged appropriately and gets better, right? Now, it's not all physiology. And here's the real interesting part. Part B of systemic fatigue, the second part, is CNS fatigue, psychological fatigue, okay? What does that mean? Here's the thing, trying really hard in training is psychologically fatiguing. It beats you up at an almost emotional level. And all of you have felt this before. You're trying and you're trying. How many sets to failure does it take? And how many weeks of sets to failure until you're like, Dude, I don't want to train anymore. It's tough to try really hard. And it gets tougher as fatigue accumulates. So when week one, you can come in and smash shit. Week two, you're golden. Week three, you know, it's tough. Week four, five, six, you might just lose touch entirely with why the hell you're training at all. Your ability to try hard goes down the drain over time. Very, very, very pertinent. And we have ways to make sure that this doesn't stop us in training. Because remember, if you're psychologically not willing or interested in pushing the biceps as hard as they can be pushed, then you're capping the psychology. And maybe that psychological challenge makes you mentally stronger but you know, we're, this is a hypertrophy lecture. We're trying to get jacked to mental strength. Sweet. We'll do some meditation or something. You got to make sure that your psychology is not limiting and we're going to have ways to make sure to do that. Point number C, point number three here is cytokines. So cytokines are essentially a variety of different kinds of molecules that get released from a cell when it has expended a high level of effort and or when it's been damaged. And these cytokines are really, uh, a lot of them are pro-inflammatory. So what they do is they essentially communicate to various parts of the immune system and they say, hey, we're messed up over here. Come help us. So the immune system infiltrates those areas and starts the repair process, so on and so forth. But the immune system has a way of degrading performance even further. It's kind of like, you know, if a building, and I've used this analogy before in our plus, if a building gets damaged by a pretty gnarly storm, you can still get work done in the building until the repair workers come in and start fixing stuff. Then they take up all the space. They take all the lights. They're in the way. You can't really get a ton of work done or as much work done. So, you know, if you have a huge holiday rush and there's a storm and breaks a couple windows, you might just patch those windows up and just finish doing your work so you can go on your holiday vacation after all the business is done. But, you know, why would you do that? Why don't you just invite the workers in? Well, you know, the workers tend to gunk up the works until they're done finishing everything and then productivity goes back up. So cytokines, what they end up doing is they essentially, in, in some sense, attract uh, immune system elements to come in and fix stuff that depresses local ability. But here's the thing, when cytokines are secreted from a small muscle, you know, they go to other places, but they're just not that much of them, not that many of them, or a muscle that hasn't been damaged excessively, or small fraction of a total muscle, no big deal. If you're training your whole body hard all the time, which is a big part of training in the last several weeks of accumulation, all of your muscles are secreting cytokines to some extent or leaking them for lack of a better term. That creates a systemic pseudo-inflammatory, not really pseudo, a systemic inflammatory response in a systemic immune response. Your whole system is basically like, shit, stuff is wrong everywhere, right? It's, it's almost like water leaks into a submarine in one little compartment, no big deal, you shut it off, whatever, we'll deal with it when we get to shore. 
water starts leaking from five and six different compartments, it's going to get into a lot of places and especially essentially everywhere. So the cytokines, when they leak out of some muscles, you know, you can train the crap out of your biceps and, you know, yeah, you get some cytokines everywhere in your body. So after a hard bicep workout, if you're going to get sick anyway, if there's a big viral load or something, that might push you over the edge immune response super compensation. Not likely. However, and you may have noticed this before, if you have a hard leg workout or a super hard full body workout, the amount of cytokine release is huge. And then if you were going to get sick, that's when you get sick, right? How many of you have gotten sick right after a huge leg workout? Like great leg workout. You go in there, maybe like you felt sort of like you were maybe getting sick before. You go in there and you fucking smash it. You come home. You know, you feel a little more tired than usual. You have a meal, you feel great. And then one, two or three hours later, you start to like be like, oh, no, yep, I'm sick. Runny nose, fever, that whole thing. That's why that happens in large part is because so much of your system has been damaged. The immune system's like, oh, something's going on. We got to respond to this, right? So remember, most of the symptoms of being sick are actually caused by your immune system's reaction, right? Um, so that's the deal with cytokines and they're proportional to how hard you're training how much volume you're training and the total volume of muscularity, which is to say, if you train more of your body in the larger muscle groups, there's more of a systemic response, more systemic fatigue to everything else. And the bigger you are, the more the response is. You can take a person who weighs 110 pounds, put them through a gnarly leg workout and they walk out and they're like, well, eh, you know, tired, right? You can put a person who weighs 250 pounds through a gnarly leg workout, and if they have huge quads, that's going to be life and death for them, right? Not in literal sense, hopefully, but if they were about to get sick, a huge quad workout could push you over the edge and get you sick as hell. If your quads are so big relative to the rest of your body that they, they secrete that many cytokines that your body's like, every time your quads secrete cytokines, your like, body's like, we're dying, we're dying, we're alert, something's really wrong, our cytokine levels are not supposed to be this high, right? Really, really, really uh, pertinent stuff. Lastly, and this isn't just honorable mention, this is very important, uh, is the cardiovascular system fatigue and other organ system fatigue. You can push your physiology so hard, it takes the rest of your body to support hard training. And especially in a cumulative sense, over weeks and weeks and months and months, the rest of your body can become fatigued. But this also occurs in an acute sense. So for example, lactic acid is produced at the local muscular level. And usually blood carries it out. And parts uh, of uh, blood, various cells and various chemical elements uh, help or sorry, various molecules help to buffer the lactic acid, essentially make it not an acid anymore, no big deal. But if you push training hard enough with enough muscles of your body, the lactic acid load can be so great that the rest of your body is not so good at dealing with it anymore and total body acidity can start to climb up. That makes you crazy, crazy fatigued and can just put you on your ass. Um, that some, uh, some of that can be seen in uh, something related to hypertrophy training, uh, you can actually do this with hypertrophy training. Um, 400 meter runners talk about hitting the wall. It's relatively rare, but hitting the wall is when you outpace yourself and your lactic acid levels get so high that your entire body essentially freezes up and you fall. <laughs> uh, people literally run and then just like that and they fall over. Then they can't get up. Usually it's not a matter of get up and finish the race. They try to get up and they're like, oh my God. Right in a couple, you know, 10, 15 seconds later, they can start start moving again, but there's no returning back to normal pace. It just doesn't happen. You can do this through leg workouts if you're, if you're so inclined, where the total body acidity is so high, you throw up and so on and so forth. And that's really like the cardiovascular system just isn't powerful enough to deal with that much fatigue and spillover at the same time. So definitely, definitely pertinent. And of course, the easiest form of cardiovascular fatigue to detect is after a set, of bench or squat or pull downs, you breathe heavy for some time and then you breathe less heavy. That's cardiovascular fatigue expressing itself. That's you actually breathing out the buffering byproducts of lactic acid to some extent, pumping oxygen through, taking away waste, so on and so forth. You can push that process so hard that you end up breathing much heavily for much longer and then your performance isn't as good, especially if you're on a fixed rest interval schedule. So if you rest for three minutes between sets, but you're really pushed a set super crazy hard with a big part of your body, Three minutes later, you could still be like, <gasps> and people are like, you're ready to go? You're like, no, I'm not ready to go. I'm going to be limited by my cardiovascular system, right? All right. That's fatigue and it's multiple causes. How do we detect them? Because some of these things are pretty mysterious. You know, we're not going to be measuring excitation contraction coupling directly. 
So how do we know how many cytokines are in our blood? Who the hell knows? We do have some clues though as to how to measure local fatigue, axial fatigue, and systemic fatigue to know when they're there and how big they are. First up, local fatigue. Fundamentally, you measure local fatigue by local muscle performance. The big thing here is compared to what? And so this third point here is, but the rest of you feels fine. Because if your local muscles are not performing at a high level, it could be because you're systemically fatigued. And of course, your local muscles are part of that system. So they're also fatigued. What you have to show is that your local muscle is fatigued, but everything else is just hunky-dory and golden. Part of it is how you feel everywhere else, right? You, for example, could curl 30 pounds for 10, top set. But a minute later, because you didn't rest long enough, you might only be able to do six. Is there a systemic fatigue at work? Sure. But a minute later, you might not even be breathing heavy. Neurologically, psychologically, you might feel 100% totally golden. And if you did an exercise that you didn't just fatigue the muscle, you might be able to hit an all-time PR. But your biceps and or the nerve that innervates them might still be fatigued. And thus, even though you feel great, stops at six instead of 10. And you go, holy crap, I lost four reps. Well, that's local fatigue. So if the rest of you feels good, but a certain muscle group, and this can even be over time, right? So if it two minutes later, a minute later, you can only do six, two days later, you can only do nine, that's cumulative fatigue, right? So it's possible to take a muscle, deplete its substrates, damage it, do all this other stuff to it, fatigue the crap out of it. And then it takes a few days to heal that fatigue and recover to where it's back to relatively normal. If you train before then, you will experience a loss in fatigue, but it gets worse. It usually takes a few days, but if you fatigue it over and over and over and over, fatigue accumulates to where now it takes five or six days for that total fatigue to clear. So when you train biceps twice a week, after several weeks of doing that, Monday's fatigue still hangs in a lot and past Thursdays and past Mondays into this Thursday. So this Thursday, you try to do the 30s for 10, you get them for eight. And that is, as we'll see in another lecture, exceeding your MRV because the cumulative fatigue of all the volume you've been summing is now so high that you can't recover session to session. And then that's definitely not a sustainable thing, right? Very, very uh, simple local fatigue. And this is super easy to detect is joint and connective tissue discomfort or soreness, right? So if you're training your biceps so much that your elbows hurt now, very, very specific, very local fatigue to those connective tissues that are part of the joint structures of training your biceps. Super, super straightforward. Axial fatigue. The easiest way or the most straightforward way to detect axial fatigue is difference in performance between more and less axially loaded moves for the same muscle group. Easiest example here is squat versus leg press. If your squat is starting to tank or you're still hitting your reps, but the reps are way harder, but your leg press is golden as day, totally you're just grooving, hitting PRs left and right, it's not your legs that are tired. Well, what the hell's between your legs and the bar in the squat? Ta-da, it's your core, it's your axis, it's your spinal cord, right? Makes perfect sense. Bent over row versus machine row. A bent over row, you have to support your own body and their spinal throughput. On a machine chest supported row, it's really just your rowing muscles, lats and rhomboids and stuff, and your spine doesn't have to do a whole lot of anything. So if your machine row has fallen and your bent row has fallen in performance, Clearly, it's either local or systemic. It's not axial because whatever is affecting that is the muscle or the whole rest of the body too. But if your bent row is starting to suffer, but you're hitting PRs on machine rows or on pull downs and all those other muscle or exercise that use the same muscle, clearly it's not systemic because you're still performing really well in those local muscles. And clearly it's not the local muscles themselves because the local muscles seem to be just fine if you isolate them. But if you put the erection part in the equation, again, erection part, right? You have to stay upright in a bent row, loads the spine, uses the spinal erectors. That's where the fatigue is coming from. Another easy one just here, for example, for your own sort of edification, stiff legged deadlift versus leg curl. And it's a little bit different of a movement, different muscles are involved, but you can definitely rule out hamstring fatigue. Maybe it's glute fatigue, right? Maybe it's technical something or other, but, uh, you know, the axial loading of a stiff legged deadlift is really, really intense. With a leg curl, there is no axial loading, right? Axial loading, right? And I... My, my stiff legged deadlifts didn't go super well today. I think my hamstrings are fatigued. The way you find out if that's true is... What are your leg curl numbers like? So let's say two, three days later, you hit the leg curl and you hit all-time PRs and your, your hamstrings feel great. What's the conclusion? Well, your hamstrings are fine. 
it's probably the axial fatigue between that's doing that, right? A really interesting further way to confirm that it's axial fatigue is that axial fatigue, because it's specific to the spine and the muscles that keep your spine upright, I was going to say erect again, but I didn't. Oh, there you go. I said it. Because we're looking at our hypothesis that it's really the spine that's fatigued or the spine and its adenine structures, we have to have a confirmation that everywhere that the spine is involved is feeling the burden. So for example, if your seated shoulder press um, or gee, you know, your front raise and your tricep extension are totally fine, the performance is great, but your standing barbell press performance is tanked, we suspect axial fatigue because that's the different limiting factor there. Um, but, and this is a really big but, if your low bar squats are still really awesome, if your deadlifts are still really awesome, and if your bent rows are unaffected, gee, you know, it's a real interesting hypothesis to say the spine and its ability to stay upright are tired, but it's clear it's not evident in anything except for one exercise. So if it's just one exercise that's actually loading versus not, that's a, a difference in performance, eh, man, that's not enough to conclude that. What you really want to look at is, okay, suspect that you're actually fatigued. Take a look at your lifts and all the numbers and how you feel on them. You go pull downs, golden, PRs, bent rows, problems. Hamstrings, PRs for curls. Stiff legged deadlift, good morning, problems. Squats, problems, leg presses, extensions, totally fine. You have a pattern. The common denominator there is the fact that your axial uh, loading ability is involved. That's a very good sign of axial fatigue. And remember, it's not systemic. Systemic affects everything. Everything would be down, right? A really interesting thing, just, and this is more of like a sort of coaching wisdom thing rather than a super sciencey thing, you can usually feel it in your perception of load, right? So you can feel axial fatigue, especially if you're attuned to your sensations as an athlete. When you unrack the squat bar, especially with your working weight, if you feel nice and rigid and everything feels solid and you feel strong and fast, and you're probably not very axially fatigued. If you are very axially fatigued, when you unrack a squat or try to pick up a deadlift, you get this like whoopee cushion feeling where it's like, Pfft. you try to unrack it and you're like, Ugh, right? Not a very warrior sound to make. That's the sound your soul makes. It, things feel like they're crushing you. They feel heavy. The, the load feels insurmountable. Weights just feel heavier than normal. And the deadlift, a lot of times, if your axial fatigue is high enough, the bar doesn't just, just doesn't leave the ground, right? Normally you pull four or five for sets of eight. You put 425 on the bar for a warm up because you're going a little heavy that day and you go, and nothing happens. But your legs are fine. Your rowing is fine. You just, your back just tries to round over all the time and everything feels super heavy. That's a very good sign your axial fatigue is high. Lastly, systemic fatigue. How can you tell? In an acute sense, you can tell how much an exercise systemically fatigues you by testing an unrelated muscle performance right after. For example, you want to find out, sort of a ridiculous experiment because you sort of already know the answer, you want to find out if squats or leg extensions cause more systemic fatigue. You do, this is what you do. You do four sets, four hard sets of squats one day, and then afterwards you do a set of max curls, okay? What the hell do your biceps have to do with squatting? Nothing. That's the whole point. Okay. We see, you know, we do our best on the squats and we do our best on the biceps. So we see how good we do on biceps. A week later, two weeks later, something, we do leg extensions, four, four sets max. And then we do the same biceps, same weight and see how many reps we can get. If one of those squats or leg extensions is really systemically fatiguing, that systemic fatigue is going to infect our ability to do curls. And those of you who have trained very hard before know exactly what this feels like. Someone offers you a workout and says, hey, do you want to do squats, deadlifts, overhead presses, and then curls? You'd be like, <laughs> after the squats and deadlifts alone, I'm not going to be able to overhead press anything because I'll be so smashed. I'll feel defeated. My psychology, my physiology is going to be just a ridiculously just bashed in. And someone could be like, yeah, I hear you. But like, what does the shoulder press have to do with squat? And you're like, well, it's axial load and systemic. They're like, okay, well, what about just like a seated machine curl? 
Have you guys ever had a small muscle to work with after, after you've hit your big muscles, like a calf raise at the end of a big leg workout or like a wrist curl at the end of a big back workout? And you look at that small muscle exercise after you've beat yourself to death and you're just like, nope. You try to do it and you're so tired. You can barely get like five or six reps when you normally get 10 if it's in another place. That is systemic fatigue. So the way you can measure how systemically fatiguing an exercise is, is see how much it affects unrelated exercise. If you do deadlifts first and the rest of your workout sucks, deadlifts are real systemically fatiguing. If you do stiff legged deadlift first and the rest of your workout's pretty good, then they're not. If you do hamstring curls first, the rest of your workout is golden, then you start to see that a ratio of systemic fatigue. If, okay, so it's not just any one given muscle. Another big thing is really it's gonna affect all muscles. So when I say pick the biceps, Pick any other muscle that's unrelated and it'll have the same exact fatigue because you might have like, oh, my curls are off, but then your calf raises go super, super well. True systemic fatigue, high levels of fatigue, everything sucks. Everything else you suck at that you normally do. In addition to that, especially in cumulative, this isn't an acute sense in the sense of like during one workout. And this can also happen in an acute sense, but mostly happens in a cumulative are the psychological symptoms. You do experience this in one workout, but it is, you experience it just sitting around, not working out if it happens for weeks and weeks and weeks. Excessive systemic fatigue leads to some psychological symptoms. For example, this is a very, very common one to report in a lot of literature, powerlessness. Like in, I do mean in the philosophical sense, like you, someone's like, Hey, you know, do you think like, you can beat up a space alien if he came down here and threatened you, you know, just bullshitting with your friends, hanging out. And like, you sort of like connect with your feelings. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can fuck up a space alien. Yeah, whatever. I got him. Conor McGregor, right? I'll knock him out standing up. And if someone asks you the same question and you truthfully in your heart of hearts feel what kind of answer, like, hey, could you beat up a space alien? But you're in week six of an accumulation or systemic fatigue is crazy. Your honest feeling about how you would do, you'd be like, no, <laughs> probably beat me up. You'd be like, why? Like, man, I just, I don't know. I just don't, you just lose your mojo. You lose the sensation that you are a person that can get things done, right? Not the greatest thing in the world, especially in relation to training. And secondarily to that, your desire to train is very predictably hampered. When your systemic fatigue is low, specifically the psychological component of it, you feel like you just want to tear shit apart. Like at the end of a deal of week, you're like, let me in. I want to eat weights, metal. I just want to eat metal. That's what I want to do. I want to lift the whole world. When your systemic fatigue is really high, someone's like, gym, and you're like, what? I don't ever want to see the gym again. You look at weights and you're like, those things are just meant to hurt me. You feel deflated and you're, you don't have any interest in training whatsoever. That's not a bad thing at the end of a mesocycle because your systemic fatigue is supposed to be high. But if you aren't mindful of your fatigue and you go for too long for too long, that's really going to interfere with training and all those other things. If you get really in the hole, or in other words, your systemic fatigue gets much higher, your sleep abnormalities are going to start to present themselves. Two really common examples. You have trouble falling asleep at night and you, uh, uh, so, uh, sorry. So one is you have trouble falling asleep at night, but sometimes you fall asleep really fast at night. Like you just like watch the TV and you knock out. Unfortunately, you'll have weird dreams and you'll wake up a lot. That's one of them. And another one is you mysteriously wake up super early in the morning for no damn reason at all. And you're just awake. One of the reasons is that as systemic fatigue rises, part of one of the responses is cortisol. And this is part of the inflammatory response. Cortisol goes up. Cortisol is, is a stress response hormone, and it's actually just designed to keep you awake. Cortisol is normally high early in the morning, which is when people wake up. So you naturally, you know, like you, you sleep long enough at some point, like even if you're trying to sleep in, you're just like laying in bed and you're like, mm, I'm awake. You try to close your eyes and you're like, nah, I'm awake with my eyes closed. Like there's no more sleep to be had. That can happen much earlier if you're overreached because cortisol is just higher. So when it just starts to edge up, it gets higher earlier because there's a whole lot of cortisol uh, secreted already. And what ends up happening is you're supposed to wake up at 8 a.m., be super rested. You fell asleep at midnight just like you always do, except it was shitty sleep for the last five hours because of the sleep problems. And then you wake up at five in the morning and you're like wide awake, wide awake and nervous and pissed and feel powerless and don't want to train. Not a good, not a good scenario. But when all these things happen together, it's pretty easy to tell they're happening together. I've been personally through this a whole bunch of times at the end of every mesocycle, more or less. If you have more defined metrics, you know, your resting heart rate can become elevated. Um, 
you're more likely, more likely to get sick again from the immunogenic response. Um, and sometimes you don't have an infection of any kind, but you feel pre-sick all the time. And pre-sick, uh, a lot of you, uh, we're going to know as soon as I say what this feeling is, it's that feeling of, of like, um, really just out of nowhere weakness where you're like, want to get the remote and you're like, ugh. You get up and move around. And you're like, ugh. And people are like, hey, do you want to go out and have fun? And you're like, no, I don't, ugh, I don't want to do anything. Right. And it's a physical weakness that you're feeling. And if there are various bacteria and viruses present in your body at certain concentrations at the time, that leads into actual sickness. But it doesn't have to. You can just sort of feel like you're pre-sick for hours, sometimes days and longer at a time. Right. So that's how you know that you have systemic fatigue. Now, now that we know all the different kinds of fatigue, how do we interpret fatigue? We can take a bunch of different roads here. Not all of them are correct. We could say fatigue is the worst thing ever and we never want to have it. The problem is any overloading stimulus also brings with it fatigue. So if we say we never want any fatigue, we have to eliminate all overloading stimulus. Not good. So fundamentally, fatigue of most types accumulates over the metal cycle. It just does. And that's okay. But the fundamental question there is, is how much fatigue is too much? Because there is such a thing as too much. So we can actually examine this at the level of set to set fatigue, exercise to exercise fatigue, session to session fatigue, and session to session leads into week to week to week. Okay. So let's take it from the top. Resting between sets. How do you know how much fatigue to drop before you can do another set? Well, it turns out local fatigue, not caused by the nerve, but caused by the muscle itself is actually hypertrophic. So that's really cool. So what we want to do is make sure that our limiting factor in the next set is going to be the local fatigue, which means that systemic and axial fatigue have to be lower than the local fatigue uh, that is occurring at the muscular level before you start the next set. So for example, if you just finished a set of bicep curls and you feel like, oh, you feel really defeated, super tired psychologically, you're breathing heavy, okay, and you don't feel strong, it's not time to do another set yet. After a couple seconds, couple minutes, you're going to feel just fine. Your breathing is no longer heavy. So your cardiovascular system is probably not limiting your performance anymore. Your central nervous system and just the, all the systemic stuff, it seems to be pretty good. Like you're ready to do another hard set. And then when you do your bicep curls close to failure, you feel a deep burn and a deep lack of local force that's limiting you. You don't feel weak and like you can't really talk to your biceps. You feel like you're talking to them just fine, but then something in them is like, oh crap, like they're really struggling. That's what you want. Almost all of your sets, probably all of your hypertrophy sets, you want to feel limited, even if you don't stop at failure a couple reps short, you want to feel the local muscular limit coming. It's on its way. It's super close. Like I was doing hamstrings earlier today and I was doing leg curls for high reps, which is awful. Hits the spot, but it's awful. Welcome to training. And I felt fucking jacked and I felt super motivated. And or towards the end of my set, like I'm pushing and my hamstrings are contracting, but this feels like there's this like enlarging ball inside of them of just uselessness and tons and tons of lactic acid. It's more and more pain and the muscles just like doing that. That's how you want a set to end. Not that you don't feel any of that and you're just doing leg curls. You're like, uh, three, five, and then you get to seven and you're like, Ugh. You just stop. And someone's like, feel that in your hamstrings? You're like, no, I don't know. No. Like, why'd you stop? Like, uh, cause like I ran out of breath. There's a good one. Or I just didn't feel like I could keep going, which is very, very much central fatigue, systemic fatigue, not what you want. Right. So how do we know how to do another set when we know, and this is through experience and experimentation and perception of how you feel and how your breathing is when you know the muscle is going to be the limiting factor again. Then you're good to go. And like we've been through this before with rest times, um, with your calves, there's really not much systemic anything going on. So you can do calves back to back to back every 15 seconds and every set is limited by the muscle itself. Awesome. But for something like squats, you might need to do four minutes of rest between squats because otherwise it just turns into pure cardio or something like that. What about between exercises? It's really the same thing. Between exercises is you rest as many, uh, you know, sets, as many minutes as it takes between exercises so that when you start the next exercise, it's not junk volume and you're still pushing hard with your local muscles, right? Part of that is really interesting. Part of the warm up between exercises, 
is to get your nervous system attuned and to get blood flow in the area and to get your muscle fibers to shift in their direction a bit, to get ready to make sure the muscle itself is performing very highly so that it is the limiting factor, right? Because if you stop doing squats and just get on leg presses, do no warming up at other and just start doing leg presses, your working weight, you're going to, when your leg press set is over, you're not going to get as many reps as you usually do. And it's going to be because you just kind of like sort of got tired. And it's sort of like someone could say like, hey, did you get a lot out of your quads in the leg press? You're like, yeah, I don't really feel like my quads really sort of started to feel the groove and turn on until like 10 reps into the shit. And then I had to stop at 15 because I was tired. If you warm up and do, you know, five reps at a lighter weight or at your working weight and then take a rest, your quads are now more primed. The nervous system is more primed to milk as much out of them as possible. So when you rest between exercises, doing a little warm up set and resting some more is almost always a good idea. Between sessions, Monday and Thursday, you train chest. How much does fatigue have to fall off? The answer is very simple, enough for you to at least match your normal chest performance or probably slightly exceed it to provide even more overload. So if you normally bench 225 for 10 and on Monday you did a bunch of flies and incline presses and you beat up your chest, if you get the Thursday and you're doing 225 and you can only hit six or eight, is that going to be overloading? The answer is not really because you're not even pushing your muscles past their normal abilities, right? How are you supposed to stimulate a really awesome adaptation if you're too fatigued to literally do so? Right? It's like telling someone, hey, get better at soccer, except you can only run a mile an hour. What the hell? We're not even playing soccer anymore. Right? I'll get pretty good at running a mile an hour and sort of moving super slow through the position. But that's not soccer. Right? Same idea. Your muscles have to be recovered to give themselves not at least an adequate effort and probably a superlative effort on top of that. So how do you know if you're recovered enough? Well, if your performance is good which is exactly where the MRV concept comes from, how to detect it is a lack of performance. If you can no longer perform at a certain level, there's a good chance that you're doing so much volume, you just can't recover on time. And that is why you need to back off, do less volume, so on and so forth, right? When the performance between sessions becomes a problem, that is when something should usually be done about it. A recovery session, a recovery half week, or a deload, something has to push, something has to change. All right, so taking all this together, what are the implications for training? First, super simple one, you gotta be aware of all three of the main types of fatigue in your training. If you don't have uh, any estimate of axial fatigue, if you don't know when you're locally fatigued or when you're systemically fatigued, and you don't know what systemic fatigue is, not good. Because if you don't know what these are, you can't address them individually and solve problems, right? You might have a bad bicep workout, the rest of your week was good, and you're like, I need a deload for my whole body. Well, that doesn't make any damn sense. Only your biceps are fatigued, right? You might say, oh man, Mike, my legs are super tired because my squats are in the shitter, but you notice you don't notice that your leg presses aren't in a shitter, and that's really not your legs that are fatigued, it's your back. So you might be able to do something different about that, still train your legs productively. Third point here, you should minimize all sources of needless fatigue, and we'll have a tip for how to do that in programming recommendations. But anything in your training program design that can be done another way that's just as stimulative but not as fatiguing is a good idea. And anything that's needlessly fatiguing is a bad idea because fatigue interferes with so much, it's not just free to us, right? It's cost, it's cost of muscle growth. Definitely need to keep tabs on your from outside of training fatigue right? Keep that as low as possible. Keep your life as drama-free as possible, as worry-free as possible, uh, as little pointless physical work as you can. So for example, if you're really dedicated to growing muscle, someone can say to you, hey, you know, you want to come and help me like garden. You know, you like gardening. I like gardening. Come help me, you know, till my garden for a bit and we'll have some beers after. And you're like, okay, I got a leg workout in like six hours. You say, hey, can we do gardening tomorrow? That's a really good idea, right? Because if you just spend a bunch of time bent over and using your legs up and down for gardening, you're going to have a crappy leg workout. So you got to think these things through if you want maximum performance and maximum muscle growth. Maximize your recovery strategies is another point. Get as much sleep as you can get or all the sleep you need. Get all the food you need. Get all the relaxation. Practice good nutrition, so on and so forth, because that's going to take any unit of fatigue you try to sum and reduce how much the sum is. You have crappy sleep. Your accumulation phase is three weeks long. You have great sleep, it's five weeks long. That's two extra weeks of muscle growth. Really, really, really big deal, right? And always keep tabs on your performance to know when to back off, which is one of the reasons we preach really good technique with standardized technique. Same range of motion for all the exercises week to week to week so that you know how many reps and sets you did and how much weight you did. And you can tell yourself objectively, did I perform better or worse this week or last week? You ask people, you spot them on the bench, 
And you're like, how many reps are you going for? Like, I don't know, like five. You're like, how many did you do last week? They're like, oh, I don't know. I did a different exercise altogether. You're like, sweet. You'll have no idea if you're getting better or worse until it's just apparently clear that you're super weak. Lastly, programming recommendations. First, you want to choose high stimulus to fatigue ratio exercises and mind muscle connection and try to work your technique to improve it over time. You put your feet here on the leg press last week and your knees kind of hurt a little bit. Maybe put a little bit lower, maybe a little bit higher, maybe out, maybe in. Your knees feel better and all of a sudden your technique is a little different in such a way that leads to less fatigue over time, improving your stimulus to fatigue ratio. Axial fatigue for very strong people is often limiting, so be judicious with how you pick your axial and loading movements. First, yes, you might want to squat for all your quad volume. Consider squatting a bunch and doing some leg presses. As you get more advanced and stronger, consider doing 50-50 squats, leg presses. As you get even more advanced, consider doing just a few sets of squats and then a bunch of leg presses after. And then as you get really advanced, consider doing your leg presses before your squats so that you have to use less spinal loading to get the same stimulus to your quads. And thus you sort of get, I wouldn't say the best of both worlds, but at least axial fatigue is not limiting you anymore. A big part of keeping fatigue low is to not chase weight for weight's own sake. Okay, It's not the weight that's making you better and more jacked. It is challenging the muscle at the local level. So if you do full range of motion in a high mind-muscle connection to feel that disruptive tension in the muscle, you can do that with tons of weight if you do it really poorly, or you can do that with a moderate amount of weight if you do it really well. Really easy comparison here is... Somebody who's squatting 315 pounds could be squatting more back than down, isn't really contracting their quads as much. There's no mind-muscle connection. They're usually clearly using their glutes and lower back a lot. They're cutting their depth, so on and so forth. You might be able to take a plate off each side, go to 225, teach them a real proper Olympic weightlifting high bar squat technique, teach them about the bodybuilding mind-muscle connection, slow down their eccentric a little bit. All of a sudden, every time they squat deep into the hole, their knees are super forward. And they're like, oh my God, I feel my quads physically fucking tearing. That's what we want. With 225 pounds, you were using 315 before. If you chase weight, chase weight, chase weight, it's good to get stronger from hypertrophy training but the strength should come from the training. It's not necessarily that you're using more weight that makes you bigger. It is the becoming bigger that's allowing you to lift more weight. So you should be focusing on doing as many reps as it takes to get the reps in reserve that you want for the set and to make sure every single rep and set is super high quality. If you get stronger, that means you're getting muscle. If you're not getting stronger, that means you have some questions to ask. But if you sacrifice high quality to simply put more weight on the bar, you can pat yourself all fucking day on the back to tell you, oh, I'm, I'm stronger. Well, congratulations. Are you any bigger? Like, well, I think so. Well, how do you know you're bigger? You haven't been pushing your muscles harder. You've been pushing less hard, actually. And you've been sort of cheating the system and using more leverage and other muscles and so on and so forth. So you don't even know if you're getting bigger. I'm like, well, shit, I guess you're right. So keep the focus on the muscles and the good movement practices. Let the strength come versus the other way around. On a related note, Psyching up, getting real amped for a set, causes an unbelievable amount of cumulative psychological fatigue. So most of the time, and also a lot of times it causes technical breakdown, which increases injury risk and reduces your stimulus to fatigue ratio. Nothing good happens from there. In the first several weeks of your program, you probably should be psyching barely at all, maybe on the most hardcore exercises, squats, deadlifts, so on and so forth, a little bit of a psych up, but basically on nothing else, maybe anything else. Maybe actually in the hardcore movements, you can benefit from some psyching as long as your technique is really good. But for the most part, psyching up and training is just not something high-level athletes really do. Psyching up in competition, great. But you chose bodybuilding, so you don't even need to psych up in competition, right? It's just a beauty pageant, for lack of a better term. But if you're using hypertrophy training for powerlifting or something like that, you want to save your psych ups for when you're doing doubles and triples. And especially, you just want to save your psych ups for the actual platform. In training, you want to do a really good job, psych up enough, you know, be awake and alive and have an intent about your actions, but don't lose your mind and start thinking of your shitty childhood or whatever the hell gets under your skin. Now you guys know what gets under my skin. All right. Low reps in reserve at the beginning of a mesocycle and lower volumes so that we're getting a really good bang for our buck and only layering in more stimulus when we need it. The last thing in the world you need is a shitload of volume, super close to failure on week one of your mental cycle. Because you can ask yourself the question, do I need that to grow robustly at the beginning of a meso when I'm super sensitive to growth? The answer is no. So why am I doing it? 
You get a little bit more growth, sure, but you get so much fatigue, you get two or three weeks into your meso, you'll have to deload again. And do you grow during your deload? Not really. Right? Do you set up any growth with your deload? Sort of, but the setup is to allow yourself to train hard more. But if you train so hard that you essentially self-extinguish, it's kind of like trying to get the best marshmallow possible, except you put it into like an arc an arc welder every time and and it just blows up. And you're like, well, okay, it's all black and disgusting. And oh, I, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Right. Maybe if you turn up the heat a little slowly, you get exactly the marshmallow that you want, and then you can take it out of the heat and eat it. Right. Same idea with muscles. We're not there to destroy. What is the the notion there? Um, um, stimulate, don't annihilate, right? And that means in the first week of training, be easy with your reps and reserve. Your muscles go really, really well from really minimal stuff if they've been detrained for a week. But as you keep going and going and going, then you layer on more and more and more. We don't want to front load a ton of fatigue because it's going to gunk up the works for the rest of everything we do, right? Keep track of which muscles are locally fatigued and deload them when needed. And not technically a weak deload, but a recovery session, a light session, right? Sometimes your biceps are overreached, but you have two or three weeks left of everything in your body to still accumulate fatigue and you're totally fine. You're not remotely systemically fatigued and nothing else is locally fatigued. Does that mean you need to take a full deal for your biceps? No way. So know which muscles are performing how. And sometimes when your biceps have reached an MRV, and we'll talk about this in another lecture, you can pull back on your biceps and not have to pull back on anything else, right? Lastly, always keep tabs, especially in the last weeks of accumulation on your systemic fatigue. And remember this, when your systemic fatigue is high, only a full body systemic deload, probably for a good amount of time, like a week, is going to actually reduce your fatigue to a meaningful level. If you are not eating anymore, lack of appetite, you're barely sleeping, so on and so forth, you hate training, deloading just your biceps is not going to cut it. What you need is a week of all muscles deloaded at the same time to bring down the fatigue like crazy so that you're super pumped, super psychotic, and ready to get after another awesome accumulation phase. Folks, thank you so much for tuning in. See you next time.